for mankind, uh, also regarding uh, science, culture, uh, philosophy, and so on. Now we are under a time of complexity shock. But before that, and very significantly, about a hundred years ago, we have undergone a conceptual shock. And without understanding that shock, you are not going to understand the <coughs> consequences of the complexity shock either, and why we need, uh, why we need a reform in education and, in a way, science and philosophy itself. So, let us go dive into the depths of dangerous intellectual waters, where big sharks are lurking <laughs> in the deep blue. Um, there have been three extreme shocks in the beginning of the 20th century, and here are the big shocks. Relativity theory, quantum mechanics, and Gödel's proof. It has completely changed the picture how we conceive the world, and we have learned a lot about the limitations of our understanding. So I'm going to present examples of, of, of these three. Now here is the here is the famous tweet paradox, uh, which is a direct consequence of relativity theory. Relativity theory, the special relativity, was conceived by three people: um, Lorentz. Einstein and Poincaré, um, who barely talk to one another, by the way. I mean, this is a, this is a very interesting thing. Poincaré and Einstein especially didn't like each other. Um, but Einstein was the most radical in drawing the conclusions of the theory. And then he went on to general relativity in the next 10 years, where he was basically playing alone, except for a very famous mathematician called Hilbert, who was a little bit faster in the mathematics. So the first version of general, first mathematically correct version of general relativity comes from Hilbert and not from Einstein. But it was different times. Einstein actually, and Hilbert actually explicitly says in the paper, you know, I took all the bits and pieces from Dr. Einstein, and of course the credit uh, regarding the physical picture is entirely due to him. Now I can assure you today this would never happen. <laughs> In I, I absolutely hate what is happening now in contemporary science, but uh, we might come back to it. Anyway, so even in the twin paradox, here are two guys, uh, friends, Miko and Miki. And uh, Miki, um, uh, Miki is uh, staying on the Earth, and uh, Miko is aiming for the stars. Uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, idea, aiming for the stars, and it might happen sooner than you expect. Uh, because, actually, um, we have better ideas about fast propulsion uh, today, which may, uh, which are still under uh, development. But if, for example, one of the drives that are being developed will work, then you could get to Mars in 70, 70 days. So we shall see that. So, um, yeah, uh, Miko uh, is uh, leaving the Earth with the spaceship uh, and, you know, goes to see, uh, I don't know, a star, whether there is life there. And probably disappointed, he comes back because he didn't find life there. That's the most likely, by the way, I, as a biologist, you can take my word for that. That's the most likely that there will be no life there. And then uh, he's coming back and look at this chap. You know, he, he could hardly wait because he was not sure that he would die before, you know, his comrade comes back. And look at this, huh? <laughs> oh, what happened, right? So, Mickey is, you know, an ancient uh, old gentleman, probably uh, in his uh, hundred and uh, second year. And this is, uh, this is Miko, who apparently didn't age at all or very little. Now, this is exactly what we know is true. Right? So there is ample proof that time elapses exactly like this. If you are traveling fast, and you are traveling long distances, and you come back. Of course, nobody has done the travel yet, but, uh, you, but uh, you, you can do this kind of uh, uh, experiment with, for example, elementary particles, and you know exactly that this is the kind of thing you can have, uh, that happens. Now, I have to give you a warning. Of course, that does not mean that this guy, you know, um, <laughs> that uh, this guy, because time goes slower for
for him. That doesn't mean that he can read more books. According to his own time, he is able to read as many books <laughs> as if he stayed on earth. So don't get confused. But the, the relationship between the two ages when he returns to the earth is exactly this one. One is considerably older than the other. With great reluctance, I decided not to explain this to you, although I can. I can explain this you, to you, if you are interested later, in about 20 minutes. You can understand the twin paradox, and it doesn't need algebra, it needs only a series of drawings. But it takes 20 minutes, so I can just tell you that this is actually an easy case. You can understand, but it still boggles the mind. Why does it boggle the mind? It boggles the mind because it was in 1905 that the conscious knowledge of mankind has gone beyond the instinctive knowledge of the nervous system. That's a remarkable point, right? Because in Newtonian physics there is nothing that really surprises you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, because, but if you understand what friction is, immediately everything falls into peace. Nothing falls into peace, right? I mean, you look at it, it's completely crazy. I mean, this cannot happen. But it happens, and this was the first major shock. There is no absolute space line, that is what it means. It's relative, relative to the extent that it can give you this spooky effect, which is uh, very disturbing. Okay, now, second, quantum mechanics. Here is a skier, right, skiing <laughs> gracefully down the slope, but if, if you look at the trail, you say, oh my god, how is this possible? Now, you cannot do it, and this is why you think this is absolutely <coughs> possible. But an elementary particle can do exactly this, right? So, what people did was, uh, and uh, uh, during the origin of quantum mechanics, was the double slit experiment. Now, uh, ever since Huygens, who was a contemporary of Newton, uh, physicists uh, were very excited about the propagation of waves. And you know, you can do your own experiments, you take some kind of a barrel, and you know, if you fill up with water, and then you start, uh, you know, um, puncturing the surface of the water, and then the concentric rings will go, right? And if you puncture at two places, the concentric rings will extend, and all of a sudden, you know, they will meet, and then you will have, have an interference, <laughs> right? Some of the waves will get higher because they strengthen each other. Other, at other points, the waves will be lower because it, they are in opposite phases. Right? Now, first of all, people had the idea that elementary particles, not only the photons, but, uh, but uh, electrons, protons, anything which is small enough, has this wave type behavior as well. That's the, that's the famous particle and wave duality. There is no single truth, right? I mean, that was an amazing shock, right? There is no single truth. Truth is a combination of these two views. An electron is a wave as well as a particle, depending on what kind of experiment you probe it with. And now, uh, so uh, they also probed electron with a so-called double slit experiment. So, you know, here is a, you know, an obstacle. Here are, the, here are the two slits. And you can have an electron gun, and you can shoot the electron uh, through it. And then here is an observing screen. And the observing screen is uh, actually recording whether an electron reached it at a certain position, right? And, you know, it's, you can, it can produce a photon, you know, a light particle, whatever. So you can record where the electron landed on the screen. This is very important. Now, the first experiment was that they just were just bombarding this obstacle with many electrons. Huh? At any time, there were, you know, it was an army. An army of electrons was going through it. <laughs> and then what they did, you know, was this kind of, what they saw was this kind of interference pattern. Right? If you have only one slit open, there is no interference, just like ordinary waves would do. If both slits are open, then you have an interference pattern. In certain positions, many electrons will have reached the screen in other positions. The 
The cop-out would be that, yes, sure, there are many particles, there are many molecules in water, therefore, it's understandable that there can be a wave phenomenon. Now comes the mind boggling part. Just shoot, shoot one electron at each instance, right? So, electrons are being shot one by one. It can have only one uh, recording in the screen, right? But then, what you can do is it, it can leave a mark. Every electron can leave a mark on the screen coming one by one. As the experiment progresses, look at this. What happens? It's an interference pattern. There was only one electron at a time. Now from that people concluded entirely correctly the electron, <laughs> a single elementary particle, can sense whether the two slits are open at the same time or not, even if they are a macroscopic <laughs> distance away. Thank you. No? <laughs> it's really, I mean, it was the right moment. We didn't agree, right? I'm really sorry. No, 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 no it was not just the right moment, but please keep to that. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so the, this, this is again amazing. Nobody could have foreseen a result like this. It boggles the mind because in your macro world, this cannot happen. For the electron, it happens. That was the second major shock. Now we go over to the third. That's, you could argue that's even more foundational. I mentioned already uh, David Hilbert, who was regarded as the princeps mathematicorum, you know, the prince of the mathematicians. Uh, he was the only one to have acquired this kind of recognition after Gauss. Gauss was also regarded as the <laughs> Princess Mathematicorum and Hilbert was the Princess Mathematicorum. And he had a program for the future development of mathematics. It looked like a little bit like a five year plan uh, of a communist country or the plans for discoveries in Brussels for the coming four years. You know, it's entirely barn, you cannot plan discoveries, but. Okay, that was a footnote. So, uh, so Hilbert's program was, of course, very intelligent, you know, but uh, the idea was ultimately that you could, uh, there are the two things, that you could prove everything in mathematics that is provable, provable right, and is real. That it, so everything that is true is provable. And the second uh, uh, idea, major idea, was that ultimately you will get an automated mechanism to do it. Right? You don't even need people for that. There will be a, an, autom an algorithm for producing mathematical proofs, and ultimately you can prove everything that is true. Now, here is Kurt Buebel. Kurt Buebel was born in Brun, Bruno, which is in the Czech Republic, <laughs> and uh, it's amazing that two people, uh, one is like him, Kurt Gödel, the other one is Gregor Johann Mendel, you know, one of the greatest biologists of all times, who were born in a relatively small town, it feels a little bit like Kösek, and this is not bad for a Central European <laughs> town, uh, to be honest with you. So Kurt Gödel, uh, he was a real mathematician which means that in many dimensions he was absolutely hopeless, right? So, <laughs> he absolutely hopeless. Uh, he, for everyday things, uh, uh, and then unfortunately he also became paranoid later in his life. So, and there was a, a lady, a woman, a, an actress, who somehow fell in love with this crazy person. And, and uh, sorry? This is Mendel? No, no, this is good. No, 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 no. And Gödel, uh, and, and it was this lady who extended his lifespan, basically, for several decades, because otherwise he would have com uh, committed suicide a long time before, which he ultimately did in Princeton. By the way, it's good to mention that, that uh, uh, Einstein, as well as poor Gödel, were the first, among the first recruits to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. You could argue that the whole institute was made for them because it is unprecedented giants. And I cannot resist telling you a footnote about this. So, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that's a good lesson for us. 
Um, when the Princeton Institute was I 50 years old, there was an incredible celebration. And, uh, you know, all the descendants of the donators were invited, the sons of the different sons and daughters of the different rich people who have donate, donated something to the institute. And the director of the place very proudly, you know, points to the, you know, to the lawn where something like uh, the eight Nobel Prize winners were pacing up and down, you know, talking to each And he said, isn't that marvelous, you know, look at all these intellectual giants. And, and then one of the guys says, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what else he could have done with all that money? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's so, that, so an even achievement is no guarantee for anything. That's, that's an incredible result uh, of this uh, little conversation. So this is how John von Neumann regarded Goebel. This is quite something because Johnny, uh, Johnny was the smartest man in the world. Uh, when, when von Neumann died, people like <laughs> Eugen Wigner and several other very famous people published a book with this title. Johnny was the smartest man of the world. Now that's quite something. Now the smartest man of the world said that, okay, he may maybe an, an even smarter person, yeah? So good, good words achievement in modern logic is singular and monumental. This is a nice word that Sean is using, monumental. Indeed, it is more than a monument. It is a landmark which will remain visible far in space and time. Beautiful space time is there in the background. The subject of logic has certainly completely changed its nature and possibilities with great achievement. Okay? So what did he prove basically in the 31 paper? That uh, if there is an axiomatic system that is as rich as arithmetics of the natural numbers, yeah? one, two, three, five. arithmetic systems use elementary computations that you can do with them. So if a mathematical axiomatic system is at least as rich as standard arithmetics, then if it is consistent, which means doesn't have internal quantity, then it cannot be complete. And the co sorry. Ah, sorry. What did I do? And the consistency of the axioms on which the whole damn thing is built cannot be proven within the system. That was the ultimate when the bottom of the world has fallen out. Huh? There is no certainty anymore, people felt, and to a great extent, rightly so. So, uh, Gödel annihilated the Hilbert <coughs> program in mathematics, and that was an incredible insight. Now, what does it mean in a slightly more concrete terms. Okay, so Gödel essentially constructed a formula that claims that it is unprovable in a given formal system, right? So I'm not going to give you the proof because that needs mathematical thinking and that's hard. But he, he um, meant uh, the axiomatic system as such onto the set of natural numbers, basically. So then every statement has a serial number, right? It's, it's method, and then you can do certain gimmicks with it. And what he was able to show, that in this mapping, there is a statement that says, that claims that I am unprovable in the formal system in which I am. Okay? He says it about himself. Now, the interesting thing is, if it were provable, it would be false, right? If it were provable, then it would be false, because this is not what it claims, which contradicts the idea that in a consistent system, provable statements are always true. Does there really always be at least one true but unprovable statement? That is for any computably enumerable set of axioms of arithmetic. There is a formula that is true of the arithmetic, but which is not provable in that system. Right? What does it mean in other terms? You know, mathematicians thought that all of mathematics is like a big <laughs> continent. So wherever you start, you know, this is a theorem here, you can go to the other theorem across you know, a, a number of steps. Right? It might be very long, but it can get. What Gödel showed 
that there are these islands of truth and you cannot, just cannot get from this continent to the island by the established, established methods of mathematical proof. Okay? Codera demonstrandum. That was really excellent. Shocking. What can you do? You can step out of the box. This is part of the you can construct a richer system, right? Okay. And in the richer system, that you add the extra dimensions basically. Okay, if there is a dimension in it, then of course you can reach that. But in the richer system, there will be a game <laughs> of islands. Okay, so that is an infinite hierarchy of you know unprovability. So that was the conceptual shock at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, the, 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 again, I have to say that the problem is that the conscious knowledge, the formal knowledge of mankind, has gone beyond the instinctive knowledge of the nervous system. In the, and this is why we cannot familiarize ourselves completely with these things, because these things are completely out of our everyday um, experiences. Now that was the, the conceptual shock. A hundred, about a hundred years later, we went to the complexity shock. Now, the complexity shock was already dealt with by, for example, Sean. So, let me just tell you that if you look at the picture of evolution, right, what you, what you <laughs> see, you know, when you are going, you know, across this spiral, you will see that the, during the course of the 3.5 billion of evolution, uh, there was a number of critical steps where the complexity in the biological world has significantly changed. Uh, for about half of the lifetime of the biota, there was only bacteria on Earth. Right? That's uh, uh, something like 1.8 billion years. Only bacteria, nothing more complicated. Our cells that you are made of, neurons, kidney cells, whatever, are eukaryotic cells, which means just complicated cells with a proper nucleus, and they are extremely worlds apart from each other. But that took half the lifetime of the biota, to have gone from nothing to the eukaryotic and then another come from the eukaryotes to the <coughs> something like a so-called intelligent civilization. So that complexification, it's an awful word, but we can use it for technically, complexification has gone on in the living world, you know, with an accelerating pace. Now, something like that. Uh, uh, is uh, being continued, and you can construct different measures for it. One uh, measure is the, uh, the energy rate density. You know, how fast you are uh, uh, consuming energy per gram. And if you look at this, this has actually accelerated steadily. So computers, in that sense, are more consuming, so this uh, energy rate density is increasing steadily, it's, it's going up because you have many calculations in a very small space. Of course, the sun, in absolute terms, producing much more energy, but if you calculate it per gram and per, uh, per unit time, uh, the acceleration is actually tremendous. So that's all, this is also continuing. And this one, right, is related to the complexity crisis because it's dealing with this information. Just a short question of identification. Mm -hmm. Cultural evolution means all kinds of development um, outside of, of the directly biological. Excellent, yeah. Everything. Excellent, yeah. 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 This one. Okay, but there is a problem. The problem is that we have a discrepancy between what we are experiencing today uh, and what we have to do now. You see, uh, the homo, the, the, uh, the, this lineage that led to us, separated from the great apes about five million years ago. It took five million years of evolution to get to, to us, and during that five million years of evolution, the world had a certain complexity, undoubtedly, but that complexity was stationary for a long time. So, cultural <laughs> evolution, although it happened already 
In the times of Homo erectus, uh, it seems, because we know from the, 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 the tools and the whatever, but it was so slow that, for example, the form of the hand axe didn't change for something like several hundred thousand years. I mean, that's not some, that, that, that's not the best taking um, uh, pace of, of uh, technological evolution, right? We are completely out of that range today. So these guys, uh, for these guys, it was practically true that nothing really profoundly new or shocking happened in their lifetime. People died, people were born, but that was business as usual. For us, you know, just in my humble lifetime, and uh, I'm 56 now, if I count the number of inventions, technological, cultural ideas, whatever, that happened in a surprise, it's amazing, right? It's much more, it's much more than what happened between Homo erectus and, let us say, before the origin of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Now, people were not evolving under those circumstances, right? So our capacities to cope with the world is very good, but definitely we were not adapted to this range of we see. We were adapted to, to something like this, and there were two things that were important. That it was always survival in biological evolution that was very important, of course, and there were two elements of that. You had to be able to fight uh, successfully against the animals. Now, that doesn't take too much uh, intellectual power, by the way. So for that, Homo erectus was already good enough, we know from the record. So why did you get smarter? Uh, it's very interesting that the other discoverer of uh, modern evolution theory, Wallace, realized that that was a big problem. And he argued that <laughs> what he cannot explain by the mechanisms of evolution of natural selection is our intellectual capacity because we seem to be much, far, much smarter than it would be needed for survival against the animals. You see the point? It was so shocking that Darwin wrote him a letter saying that what are you doing? You are going to kill our baby or what? Huh? He was very annoyed by this. Now we understand this thing better and it, you are not going to like it. Uh, one of those statements. Uh, you are not going to like it. The data seems to be that uh, what was very common during the hominization is something what we call parochial altruism. Right? Parochial altruism means that you are very cooperative and nice within your local group and occasionally you fight as hell with other groups. But the people in other groups are as smart as you and I am afraid that probably, as we see it, was a major driving force of uh, evolution, leading to the kind of intelligence that we have today. Because you had to compete with others that were as smart as you. Now, um, now so then, you see, it says it, there was a complex <laughs> tsunami in the late 20th, early 21st century. And what we would like to do then is to ask the question, can we have the human brain in coping with complex, with this complexity? Not to replace it. And I'm going to explain in a moment that there is a certain tendency to replace it. I would not like to see that. I, I know it's a little bit personal, right? I think I'm a reasonably smart guy and uh, I would hate that, you know, that uh, some, somebody would come and, you know, Russia, I'm afraid they are completely replaceable by this or that computer. Uh, that, that would disturb me. So the, one of the questions, how, how can you augment the capacities, the cognitive capacities of humans so that they are not going to be completely replaced by computer, for which there is an indication. And now first I will present you the indication. It will scare you, probably, especially if you haven't heard about these things before. Right. Now, that happened just a few months ago. Uh, there is a company called DeepMind. DeepMind is a company in London uh, that was created a few years ago by three, I would say, geeks or hackers or whatever. Huh? And uh, it was amazing that that company was bought up by Google 
for about 300 million pounds without the company having achieved anything up to the point of the purchase. Did people go mad at Google or what? Huh? You don't understand this the traditional economic reason. Why would somebody do that? And then what they the, after that, you know, they got the influx of resources from Google, and then they started to churn out the results. The trick is that these people, these three geeks who founded the company, were hiring the young postdocs from the best artificial intelligence laboratories all over the world. So they were monitoring, you know, the PhD dissertations and whenever they liked some, they sent immediately a cable that after your defense, we cordially invite you. Okay? And they, they offered a huge salary. So they, just, they did, didn't do anything else but building up intellectual potential. And it was partly based, based on money that they uh, generated this other type of business before, partly, you know, as usual, you know, borrowing and credit and this kind of thing. And of course, it has paid off tremendously. Mm -hmm. Now, a few months ago, um, a major paper was published by DeepMind, and it is about the incredible victory over the world champion of the game Go, by an algorithm that was constructed at DeepMind. <laughs> now, of course, people could argue that this is not entirely new because, you know, the world chess champion was already beaten by a computer and there were other instances of this performance. But for this particular game, <coughs> which is a complicated thing, I mean, you can see a little bit uh, of the screen. So there are basically two players and you have to make it sure that according to certain rules you defeat the others by encircling, uh, you know, the dots and so on. It's of course a very complicated game and the Chinese are extremely good at it. So, uh, about half a year ago, the AlphaGo, the algorithm, was able to beat the European champion. But then the Chinese said, ha ha ha, what a <laughs> European champion in, in Go, what, are you kidding? But you know that now that the that, uh, that uh, the, the, the Chinese champion was Korean. Korean. Yeah, sorry? Korean champion. Sorry, the Korean, yeah, but the Korean champion was beaten. That was a shock because the people, even the people who were absolutely knowledgeable about these things, said it would take at least a decade to do so. That is what they said a year ago. And now we are, it's done. And uh, so, what, how, how can this be possible? Because um, it's not only brute force, right? It's smarter than that. Brute force would be that you calculate, you know, the, not all the possibilities, because you cannot do that, but, but you, a, a huge number of possibilities in advance. But that's not the right way to go. Bobby Fischer, who was probably the biggest jump chess player of all times, when he was asked, how many steps do you think ahead? He said, well, more than just one, but it tends to be the right move. <laughs> so so there, must be, there is something more clever in the representation of the game. This is what, and people didn't expect that a machine would have a good representation of a game like this. But apparently this algorithm does because it's definitely innovative. The, the, the Go champion during the game stopped once for 20 minutes staring, you know, at the screen because, and he said, I have never seen anything like this before. What, what does the guy, you know, the other want to do with this? And that was one of the crucial moves to defeat the champion. Right? Now that's, you see, that, that shows <laughs> that that is something. How is it possible? Interestingly, it goes back to something which was around <coughs> for about 40 years. It's called deep learning. Uh, this is Jeff Hinton, uh, one of the fathers of deep learning. And uh, it's biologically motivated. Now let me uh, give you a, an idea why it is biologically motivated. One of the most important Nobel Prizes in biology went 
to Hubel and Wiesel about vision. And they discovered that when you are processing visual information, there is a hierarchy of layers of neurons, those cells that make up the brain, and uh, at each level, for, sorry, at the first level, you process very simple type of information, right? For example, whether a line is like this, or whether it is tilted or not, these are very elementary pieces of information, all kinds of. The second layer processes already com combination of those, right? And ultimately, you can get to something where a neuron definitely reacts to a face or a cat. Now, that doesn't mean that no individual is responsible for recognition of the cat, because there are other neurons that also respond to the cat and nothing else. But it is true that there is a group of neurons at a higher level which respond to a very higher, very high level concept, like the cat. Now, so Hubel and Wiesel knew this from the physiological experimental vision. And then people started to implement such a thing in artificial neural networks. And they miserably failed. <laughs> so there was a period when these were completely out. The people in the artificial intelligence movement said, these artificial neural networks are of no use. I mean, we can, we, we can do something smarter than that. Whereas they should have thought, OK, there must be something clever or tricky behind that, because apparently it works for the brain. But many people in the artificial intelligence movement don't care about the problems, how the brain solves it. They want to make money by solving a problem in an efficient way, and that's it. Now, what is one of the differences that led to the success, amazing success of this kind of system in playing something like Go? Now, one of the things is that computer, I'm afraid, computers became much faster. The early networks that people were using, friendly, but they were very small, very slow, and so on. So they didn't have the critical size for this kind of task. Now, um, uh, the networks that people are using are uh, really big. You know, they, they, they are on the order of a million units. Now, that's already uh, going, uh, you know, do, is doing it as you see, uh, can do an incredible amount uh, of intelligent calculations for you, but this is still far from the brain. You know? The brain uh, or, uh, works on the order of a trillion uh, such units. It's still uh, in, uh, very far from what these artificial systems can uh, practically do, but still the result is there. Now, a few ingredients, because this is very important. Okay, so there are two components that AlphaGo uses. There is a value network uh, to evaluate the board positions, and there's a policy network to select the rules. Okay, so you have to assess, you know, what you see, whether it's good for you or bad for you, and then you have to decide on a, uh, the next move, what you are going to do. That is what is called your policy. Now, how do you boost the system? because it needs to have information on both. And it was very clever, it was a combination of two things. So, the, first of all, these were deep neural networks, and uh, as I described this to you, these higher and higher level features as you progress, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the network. Now, there uh, was a combination that both these networks, you know, the, the, uh, the the policy network and the value network were trained extensively uh, on the example of human expert games. So one of the things that is very important that these, that these uh, systems are fed with an incredible amount of information on, of previous knowledge, you know, concrete examples, much more than any single individual could actually remember. That's very important because you know, they, can, they, 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 won't, they don't get bored, right? You can do that. And supervised learning means that you explicitly say whether something was good or bad because we know from the outcome of the game, right? So this kind of knowledge was explicitly said. And then, <laughs> then 
it was complemented by another thing, the reinforcement learning from games of self-play, self right? So the same algorithm was playing by, against itself, right? And he, that also, he also learned from that. But that it was reinforcement learning. <coughs> it just says, okay, you have done well. And that information that you have done well, there is a mechanism whereby this feeling good about it can be trickled into the system, and that is called reinforcement learning. It's, reinforcement learning is something that you can play with a lecturer very nicely. I recommend it to you. Okay, so there are lecturers who pace up and down all the time. You know, it can be annoying now. Uh, lecturers like to be listened to, right? So you can agree among yourselves, among the audience, that you manifestly don't pay attention eh, when, unless he's at a certain position in the room. By the end of the lecture, this guy who would pace up and down all the time, right, would steadily stand, you know, on the particular spot, don't, and he wouldn't, he doesn't realize what happened to him. Now that is reinforcement learning, and this kind of sorry, and this reinforcement learning was also put into the game, and then there was a new type of search. This is becoming very technical. Okay, so now you can say this is just the game. You can say it's uh, in a certain sense it's very creative uh, because you know it came up with moves that uh, was unprecedented. But you say okay, that's not business. That's just a game. Now that's not just a game, unfortunately or unfortunately. Now that's, this is not last year because it's a quotation, so it was something like 2013 or something like that. And there was a supercomputer in San Jose uh, with an intelligent. A reading algorithm, reading and information distilling algorithm, uh, that was fed 100,000 research papers on cancer in two hours. Okay. Has read it all and came up with new biological knowledge from that reading. Now, obviously, nobody could have done that as a human being. The algorithm was clever. It was actually the P53 gene. It's a, it's a, if, if the P53 gene corrects, uh, uh, sorry, functions correctly, then it protects you against cancer. And uh, what this guy, uh, the algorithm was looking for, is the connection with, between P53 and other genes in the literature, and also other forms of P53. And he actually discovered from the raw data that was in the papers two new forms of the P53 gene. And then these were later experimentally confirmed. Okay, that's one thing that we should make you think, but we can do more than that. It is Hod Lipson. Now, Hod Lipson uh, is also the doing this. So um, here is a nice title, it's the title of the paper actually. Automated refinement and inference of analytical models for metabolic networks. Now this is quite something. I have to explain this to you. Um, you see, metabolic networks is, you know, the, the, what you have in your cell processing, you know, sugar is converted to uh, citric acid, citric acid then is uh, used to synthesis of uh, amino acids and these kinds of things. That's the metabolic network. It's the basic uh, synthetic factory of your cell. Without that, without metabolism, you are there just trying to skip it. Now, the, the analytical model is the amazing part here. Because um, people are got used to the idea that computers are fine for number crunching, right? Making, you know, there's a big thing, it look, it's like an old-fashioned uh, calculator, but it's with electronics, but basically you turn the handle of this device and it will crunch numbers and then it will say the answer is <laughs> something like, how, how much is 2 plus 2? And then if it's not good, good enough, it will say 7, right? So, but is, is the number crunching and nothing as people thought, or people still think. It's not, an analytic model looks like this. This is an analytic model, which means that you must have the right form of the equations uh, to describe. These are dynamical equations, uh, which can describe, you know, how the uh, concentration levels of this metabolite change. So this, uh, this consists of two things. You must have the numbers right, because you, these are like the rate constants. But also you must have the structure 
right, right? That's the model. And this system that Hod Lipson and colleagues constructed can get the right structure of the model. Okay? Now, let's pause again a little bit because that really, you should not think or feel that now it's the moment that somebody is pulling the carpet from below your head as an intellectual human being. Right? Now, this algorithm does it by itself. So, from these data, this is what you can measure in the lab. The meta, by solving basically the metabolic inverse problem, here is the inferred analytical differential equations that turns out to be an accurate model of the system. I'm not going into the details of that, I'm just, I'm just highlighting that there is an algorithmic method, of course, starting with the output, collect the data, assign a fitness function, this is very important, a fitness function for the internet solutions, how good they are, and then you have to encode the, uh, the equations into a certain graph, transform the graph in a certain sense, and then you will have a, another set of equations, and then you match those equations according to the previous generation. It's basically an evolutionary type of search in the space of equations. Oh, okay, and this is a spectacular success. This paper was published a few days ago. Sorry, a few years ago, I mean two or three years ago. And uh, this, this, this work doesn't continue. So, um, now we are at a crossroad. We are at a crossroad. Because this kind of technology is going to be used not only for uh, these kinds of questions, but all kinds of questions in science. Where, and and it's, going to have, it's going to be successful in various common domains. Uh, in some domains more, in other domains less. But, but it's absolutely true. But you can feel that it's not only that uh, workers in car factories are going to be replaced sooner or later. It's not only that drivers will be replaced sooner or later. Now you can ask the question, what about assistant professors? Now that's a real question. Will they be replaced in the long run or what the heck is going on? It's a very good question to ask. So, so what are we going to do with this problem? One of the one of the things that we can do. Yes. When we continue that. So the question is what there. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that whoever generates the knowledge, of course, you would like to understand it. Right? So the fact that, for example, a computer algorithm describes a nice set of equations that's happened and it's going to happen more and more, but you still would like to understand what it is. You want to understand the world, whether it has been generated by nature or whether it has been generated by computers for you. You need to, have a, you need to develop an understanding and it is a complexity of that world, both natural and artificial, that gives you one of the major obstacles that you have to deal with. So the question is, how can you have the human mind in order to cope with these challenges, or better cope with those challenges. Now, interestingly, my colleague in Munich um, has been dealing with this problem for quite a while. Uh, he's a philosopher. Uh, he was working uh, uh, originally in the Max Planck Institute for Philosophy in Munich, and he was also a member of the uh, German delegation in the disarmament negotiations. And he was, he is a philosopher who was interested always in how complex thinking is happening. And as an applied version of that, he <coughs> always asked the question based on the disarmament negotiations, why can't work committees better? <laughs> right? mm. So, and then uh, he came up with something and out of that, uh, there is a um, uh, generalization uh, in the last decade in order to uh, help people to cope with complex situations, complex knowledge, in the way that uh, was inaccessible before. And that is that this, this new field is now termed cognostics, and uh, uh, the, the so-called cognitive excellence program is now a sub 
space of the prognostic problems. So the uh, slogan is not to replace but to open human thinking. Now, uh, what uh, um, and what uh, is the motivation uh, for that? There are several motivations behind the cognitive excellence program. Uh, one is the following. Uh, unfortunately, our teaching is hopelessly out of date. It's hopelessly out of date, and uh, it's not a miracle, I have to say, although you can say very bad words about politicians, but it's absolutely true uh, that the kinds of problems that they are faced with uh, are not going to be solvable by the things that they learned at school. Huh? Let's, be, let's be very clear about it. The fact that we know how DNA encodes genetic information or how Newton's equations work gives us exactly zero help in coping with the problems of the real world that is all you know around us with all the problems today. And the politicians sense that and they are frustrated. So there is a either they are tacit about it or outspoken about it, but they have this feeling that okay, this. Uh, you know, these eggheads are telling us that we have to support science, we have to feed scientists very well, and so on. But, you know, what do we get in return for our contemporary problems? And uh, there are, now that's the point, there are, there is knowledge around that helps us to understand the world, but that's usually not taught at school today. Still not taught at school. <laughs> could I make, could I make yeah. a, a reinforcing point? Uh, it relates to hierarchy, and Weberian hierarchy. You recruit people into your top institutions or finance ministry or foreign ministry when they're about 23 or 24. And when they get to a senior position, they're 53 or 54. And their thinking is already decades out of date. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, that that's, uh, was the realization that uh, the group in the far many days is very multidisciplinary. And once we realize that we have to sit down and we have to first teach each other what we think that from our profession uh, the others would need in order to understand the world. You see, there's a completely different way of approaching education. Right? So what we wanted to have is an intellectual survival kit that the schools don't give you. The schools give you mathematics, physics, and these kinds of things, and then, you know, when you go to, you, know, you, you specialize. Mm -hmm. You can easily uh, get to the state when a biologist, you don't know anything about the relevant and important new results in physics and vice versa. That is what you would need, but nobody is teaching. So, um, I remember a conversation, it's quite striking, it was about two years ago when Albrecht von Müller and I visited, for another reason, the Nanyang University in Singapore. Now, that, look at the ranking, that's one of the best universities in the world now, and it happened very fast, so that was quite amazing. And we had a uh, discussion uh, with Bertil Anderson, um, the, 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 the rector, the head of the university, and we described what we have done in the, you will see in a minute, what we have done in the last few years. And Bertil was looking at this, so you want to tell me that we have to reform the whole of university education? <coughs> and then we said, this is exactly what we are up to. And he said, you are probably right. Okay? So, and that's from a head of a leading university, I, I take it as a kind of a, a compliment and a very interesting throw in the wind that, you know, that something needs to be done. And, uh, and we want to contribute to this process, but it's not, you know, we, are, we don't have the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, nobody has the ultimate truth on this. I mean, we are experimenting, we are proposing, and we are working it out. And, for example, now, um, we are going to sign, I think, on my name day, <laughs> uh, July the 14th, in Munich, the formal collaboration agreement between Parmenides and Nanyang in order to uh, help transform university education at Nanyang. And if, of course, successful, then, then it's going to spread. So I'm going to show you a 
few elements of this. Uh, then, then comes add that probably. Uh, one day, yes, but you know uh, the the point is the point is that uh, uh, European universities are uh, hard enough to crack. No. You know, uh, so it's not uh, so. It was much easier to get uh, through with this uh, the Nanyang University than in Europe, and that uh, again tells you something about the inertia mm. and the sluggishness that uh, is uh, pervasive on this continent. I'm very worried about this to be. I don't. I don't want to mu uh, Europe to be, you know, just a museum, uh, as cancer of, uh, of, an, of, of a continental it's science, really and that's good. But and that's a danger. It's a real danger. I'm sorry to say. Okay, <laughs> interesting. That's that's literal. It's verbatim uh, uh, from a previous slide that I was using uh, two years ago. Um, it, it, I use it as for as in a course that we were giving to the leading um, staff members of Airbus. It was, again, about this program, because they realized that they would like to know about these things. So they created a two-week version of the Cognitive Excellence Program for the business people. And this, this was the title of one. I, I did the introduction to the course, and this is literally taken from that slide. Now, um, the whole idea goes back, as I said, partly to uh, Albert von Müller's uh, frustrating um, experience with disarmament negotiations. The other goes back to another line. Um, these people, Günther von Kidrowski was a famous chemist in Germany, Albert von Müller and Meine Wenigkeit, <laughs> it's a German, it's a my insignificance or something. So, uh, we independently came to the idea that there should be something like a European university and that European university should uh, uh, offer you that kind of integrated knowledge that would be transferable to it and you know the recognition for it, for it would, should be at a European level. I know it's a dream but this is what we had. And now I think it's almost 10 years ago that these three people independently came to this idea and then we met successor. I was the hub. So I knew Winter and I knew Albert and then there was a discussion about that. So when we decided, uh, we had several preparator meetings and the preparator meeting said that the different people who are now teaching this course were teaching each other. This is what I already mentioned. And then once we had worked it out, we offered the course um, to the CISA. The CISA is uh, um, a school for advanced uh, studies, which means that they, uh, they are doing uh, education at the PhD level in Trieste, Italy. It's a very high level thing. It's fully international regarding teachers as well as students. And it was for the PhD students at CISA. It was, select, it was a select group of PhD students to which uh, we gave the course and then uh, we have extremely positive feedback, and, but the, feed, the details of the feedback we put into the, uh, to the, into the course. Now, uh, <clears throat> what is at the core of the course is what we call TCRs. Now, TCRs are thought patterns of cross-disciplinary relevance. Thought patterns of cross-disciplinary relevance. And a thought pattern, we, we, we uh, define a thought pattern as a triangulation of model paradigm and heuristic. So this is the kind of thought patterns that we were harvesting from the different disciplines, and it was only those for which we already knew that these thought patterns really had a cross-disciplinary relevance because they had been used in several different disciplines. So you really have to know about Not all of them, right? So it's still a fair chance that people by, yeah, are not going to know about it because it was used in two or three different districts, but not in the fourth and so on, although we don't see an impediment why it was not good. So this was the procedure of, of doing it. We also identified failures of this kind of thinking. Um, that's just a, an example. Um, the, there was a Nobel Prize winning <coughs> um, um, Edelman, and Edelman even uh, published a book uh, with the title Neural Darwinism. Turns out to be, it was, it, was, it was a kind of a thought pattern transfer that he did. 
except that he did it badly, right? So there was there is a problem in the book, and uh, I don't I don't want to explain it to you know why it is, but of course this what I want to say is not an easy process to do it successfully. You need a lot of work in order to understand. Could you could you explain? I, I'm very familiar with. Edelman. Okay, I, good. I read his three books. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, is the concept is neurodarwinism rather than the title? I think uh, there is a there is a there is a there is, now there there is a book that uh, comes in. Yeah. The problem is in, in a nutshell that he didn't realize that uh, uh, selection is different from evolution. What he doesn't have uh, is the recognition that in order to have the full capacity of the system and really Darwinian, you need something like a replicator, which will, go, which will do several generations of uh, selection and generating new variants, and that is what he doesn't have. He doesn't have, and uh, his uh, close collaborator, Izikevich, told me, by the way, that he told Edelman, if you want to have it successful, you must have something like a generalized replicator in the brain. But the, the answer was, was, was really striking. You know I hate Richard Dawkins, so I don't want to go. No, let's not go into Dawkins. Let me just stop on this, because I think uh, you and I and he are reading Edelman differently mm -hmm. from myself. Okay. For example, if we take uh, mm -hmm. Sean Cleary's point that with conscious manipulation of data variables you can cope with three, four, five, but not more. One of Edelman's points is that if you cannot consciously resolve something, the unconscious seeks to do it for you. And the unconscious can traverse literally billions of uh, neuronal nodes, networks, and come up with an answer. The answer may be right or wrong, but the, an the answer may actually suggest the question for further research. But what is this? It's intuition. This is where uh, Tversky and Kahneman have got it completely wrong because they think that intuition is unreflected, stand in the dark, it's a heuristic, a shortcut. Intuition is not, it's a process. Uh, it's a process by the unconscious seeking answers and often coming up with images which themselves see, you know, for example, Kekulé uh, discovering the, the compound formula for benzene by dreaming about a snake swallowing its tail, etc., etc. Now, my point is, can computers intuit? Humans can and do. I think that uh, there is already an indication that uh, computers can do. The latest ones can do. Uh, the the, the AlphaGo can. I mean, by any rate, uh, some of the steps that AlphaGo comes up with, if a okay, if a person had done it, you would have said, "Oh, what an intuition!" But, but forgive me, I, I won't carry on for too long on this. But the AlphaGo game, like chess, has got very explicit premises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understanding complex situations, you may not have the explicit premises. So these are two different things. The fact that a computer can defeat a human when the rules of the game are known to both mm -hmm. is quite different from when there are no known rules. And there, human intuition, I think, can surpass the machine. We had this very interesting conference of Manchester in 1948 uh, with Turing and Polanyi, Michael Polanyi. But wait, sure, there's not yet the, the time of debate. But ask Spurge because it's getting late. What, when should we start a debate? Because they are very important. But I would like to uh, still explain such a few things about 15 minutes. And 15 then, minutes? That's, that's, that's or 10. 10 would be better because it's already 11.30. So it okay, should be but as, as, there is, there is, yeah, but, uh, as far as I understand, there is no other lecture in the morning. No, no other lecture in the morning. Lunch is at 12.30. All right, yeah. then, yes. No, sorry, yeah. I, I was just working I, according to the schedule. Yeah. Good. And it's a complicated Good. thing. Huh? Please. Okay, so uh, just, we, we can come back to this. Uh, I fully agree with you what you said about Edelman. Mm. Huh? What you said about Edelman, I fully agree with. Mm. I don't agree uh, with him about the algorithmic part that mm. is behind, uh, that is that is uh, working in the 
unconscious domain. It's very important, but I think what is working there, you can do much better than him. And I'm doing it, so that's... that's okay, the, okay, we'll, we'll come back to that perhaps, yes. Okay, good. So, um, all right. So here, uh, I don't want to go uh, across all of this. So then, uh, and there is uh, absolutely nothing magic. Uh, about the 24 thought patterns that uh, uh, that we identified uh, from various disciplines uh, that in, includes, for example, the uh, physics of complex systems, uh, evolution, cognitive science, and psychology, and these kinds of things. But these are the things that we integrated, you know, after years of work, so that people have an uh, this kind of survival hit that I was mentioning. I'm going to mention you a few examples of that, though, to show how a thought pattern uh, is generalizable. Now, here is, here is a thought pattern that has been taken um, uh, to several uh, different disciplines. This is the idea of evolution by natural selection. And uh, I showed this several several times already, but of course there are new people in the audience. So this is basically the mechanism that Darwin was aware of, that you need different kinds of units, and the different units uh, have these uh, uh, cap capacities of multiplication, heredity, and that is also variability in the system, so something new can arise. And it is true that among the hereditary traits that you inherit, uh, there are certain that affect either your survival chance or your chance of reproduction, the combination of physical fitness, then in a population of such units, evolution and natural selection can take place full stop. It's actually, <laughs> uh, it's actually quite amazing that you can summarize a theory with such incredible power on one slide, but it's not unprecedented. Uh, in, uh, in the natural sciences. Now, the main point is that note that there, in this formulation that we use today, there is no reference to organisms or genes or whatever. These are just instantiations of uh, the Darwinian dynamics. Now, how this thought pattern can be taken over, I'm going to show you a, a few examples. This is the Cumbrian explosion. The Cumbrian explosion, this is still biology, you know, uh, <clears throat> you have an explosion of the di in the diversity of uh, biological uh, phyla in this case, but you can uh, say it simply is biological diversity. And here is basically when uh, about the explosion it starts. It's about 550 million years ago, and the diversity is increasing even at the higher level of the taxonomic hierarchy. New and new uh, phyla are appearing. And that has not happened since then, okay? So this, despite the fact that we had uh, mass extinction afterwards, uh, there were no phyla generated. No new phyla were generated. Many species were generated, but these higher level units, for example, like the vertebrates, that is a phylum, for example, um, uh, these haven't been generated. Huh? Now, look at this. If you then follow it through after the explosion, here is what people call a, a, a clay diversity diagram. So time is going in this direction, and at a certain taxonomic level, let us say the level of the genus or whatever, you can count in paleontology how does the diversity change in the paleontological record. That's on the left-hand side. Now, look at this. Uh, if I were to cover these things here, the, the years, you would think that it's a paleontological record, right? But look at the, look at the numbers here. 1800 and it, up, it goes up to 2000. And there are you know, count of taxonomic threats from level 0 to 5. But what it is? What kind of taxonomy? Is it new bacteria species or what the heck? <coughs> no, it's bicycles actually. Um, here, are the, here are the early, early bicycle types, and what you saw was the paleontological record of the designs of bicycles. It shows exactly the pattern that you also see that occasionally you have this, what we call an adaptive radiation, which means that, that there is a 
phase in evolution where all kinds of possibilities are being churned up and then, you know, the environment, either the living and the non-living environment or the customers, start actually to narrow it down. And this is exactly what happened. In order to analyze this professionally, you have to have a bicycle but You cannot have a phylogeny, an appreciation of phylogeny, unless you have a taxonomy. So these uh, people who were engineers adopted this study, so they have established a taxonomy of bicycles. I'm not go going into the detail. And then they analyze the processes in terms of that. So actually, by the historical record they had, they were able to reconstruct the changing fitness, in this case, the popularity of the different designs of bicycles across uh, the times of uh, uh, technological evolution. Right? So this idea goes really a long way in order to actually appreciate what kinds of dynamics can happen completely uh, irrespective of where the idea originated from. Now, here I know that I'm entering into their dangerous territory because um, there was a there is a guy, Stephen Hawking, a famous physicist, who says every line of equation cuts uh, the remaining audience by one half. Uh, but still I want to show you some, I want to make a very important point because elementary, some elementary mathematical insights are parts, are parts of the uh, thought patterns that are of, that are of cross-disciplinary relevance. So this is actually the case of exponential growth. Exponential growth is that the rate of growth that you see here is actually, actually proportional to the number of units that you have. If you have two different kinds, x1 and x2, that are freely co growing, then this will be the explicit solution. At time t, you have this as a solution of the system. So, as you know, the curve goes up like this, right? Okay, this is exponential growth, which is infinite in infinite time. And k1 is just a, a rate constant uh, uh, that is a, is a parameter of the system. If it's large, of course, the growth will be faster. Now, the interesting thing is if you compare the growth of two different species or whatever, which have a, which have a different k1 and k2, then you can define what is the relative frequency of the two types. And again, it will be an exponential function according to the standard rules. And this is the punch, and this is why I'm showing this, which is so important. Look at this. So these, all of them are, both of them are freely growing. Both of them are going to infinity. There is no constraint on the system, but one grows faster than the other. So k1 is uh, bigger than k2. Since this is a, also an exponential function, although both of them are going exponentially. Both of them are going to reach infinite density in infinite time. If you make the relative concentration, the guy who has a higher k1 is going to be infinitely more uh, popular or more frequent relative to the other. So the relative frequency for the guy which has the higher k1 goes to infinity and conversely the other goes to zero in terms of relative frequencies. That's at the heart of the Darwinian survival of the fitness. It's very important. This is, this is a direct outcome of the exponential function and this is what the Reverend Malthus was, by the way, hinting at about which Darwin knew. Now, uh, I, I skip this, although it's interesting, but uh, here this is what I want to say, okay. So, but why do you think that this, this equation must be of this form? So the exponential case is this one. The rate of change is proportional to this k and the density of the units that you have. And if it's exponential, p equals 1. But there are all the others. It's a very simple equation. Why? Is it really so written and cast in stone that p has to equal 1? Well, if you play around with these ideas, then you will see that there is a case that p is bigger than 1, 
and P is smaller than 1 but bigger than 0. It turns out to be the case, and that was not known for a long time. Uh, the consequence that if P is bigger than 1, then what you have, not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the common, who is already who has already a high density, is going to win the competition, even if the intrinsic advantage, the K constant, is higher than the constant of its competitor. Which shows that if you have already got, you know, a big chunk of the resources, you are going to be able to maintain it, even if there somebody, a new species or a new product comes in, that would have a higher intrinsic uh, capacity to grow, but it has to start as a small value. Um, so that is the case of hyperbole growth. Actually, it reaches infinite, would reach infinite density in finite time. This is why it has explosive behavior. And then there is the case of parabolic growth. Then, in that case, you have the survival of everybody, but with a certain selectivity. So it's not neutral. There will be differences in uh, how the different competitors are dividing the available resources. But nobody actually dies out. And it's amazing that in order to have the classical Darwinian behavior, you have to be exactly equal to one. If you are a little bit higher, it is a little bit lower, you are qualitatively different. Why does it matter? Okay? I'm going to show you an example. Here is Brian Arthur. Brian Arthur is a non-standard economist, uh, was working in several places, including the Santa Fe Institute, which was you know, the first interdisciplinary institute dealing with this modern type of complexity issues. And, uh, he realized something very important, that especially in the fields of economy, where knowledge is very important, so in the knowledge-intensive parts of the economy, you actually deviate from the usual uh, law of uh, diminishing returns, but you have increasing returns. It's exactly the phenomenon that I, that I described to you. The growth in those areas does not follow a basically exponential type of growth if it is undisturbed. If it's undisturbed, it follow a high, it would follow a hyperbolic growth. If it follows hyperbolic growth, it has a consequence of who survives. The common survives, who has already made it, so to speak. Even if a new competitor comes in, that would be intrinsically better, uh, the chances uh, not very high. It's not impossible because uh, there is stochasticity, but in the knowledge intensive economy, you have what is called increasing returns, which in the biological case would translate into the uh, idea that the growth, the exponent of the growth equation is higher than one, and the selection consequence is qualitatively different. It was a kind so, of. Thing. Who's, who's this chap? Uh, Brian Arthur. Brian Arthur. A R. He's not the the first, you are the first to say this. No, but he was, he, was the, he was the person who made it really important. I mean, he had to fight a lot for this, for, uh, against economists, believe me. Because economists, the, the, the one thing that comes out of this uh, is that you can have, if in a complex, multiple equilibria. And multiple equilibria was something that, you know, 90% of economics hated, explicitly. Uh, okay, huh? With respect, mm -hmm. the text you've got here mm -hmm. is standard returns in economies of scale. It's not the more interesting point that you just made. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, the interesting point is that it has a consequence for the selection. That is what he was actually showing. Right. Now, so the, this was this is this is this is one example of the sort of the final uh, sort of pattern. Uh, uh, transfer that I want to show you is this one. It's a candidate, but it should be. I mention this because we are so excited about sustainability issue, and I think that uh, creative new approaches should be put on the carpet. So, this is what we did together with Winter von Piedrowski. The idea that you remember the, the exponent can be smaller than one, that's parabolic growth. Parabolic growth also reaches infinity in infinite time, but the selection behavior is different. Everybody survives if somebody has a bigger k constant, this intrinsic tendency to grow, 
it will have a higher fraction of the equilibrium, but it's not going to push out everybody out of existence by the nature of the growth law. That, actually, that was my discovery. People didn't know that before. But it, the, the, this type of growth was discovered in chemistry originally. And then we realized that it could dramatically change uh, the world of finance, the stability and sustainability of the economy. It would dramatically dampen uh, the boom and bust cycles and so on, if only, if only the central banks adopted a different way of calculating interest rates. Because what they are doing, they are basically uh, using an exponential type of growth law, and what they are fiddling around is what we call in biology the K, the Malthus parameter, that's the interest rate. What they ought to fiddle around with is the exponent, the p, right? So if uh, you approach a situation where we have crisis, you would actually decrease the exponent below one, because we know that the outcome of the dynamics is that nobody is going to, you know, uh, be extinguished. It uh, introduces a, a combination of selectivity and stability in the system. And what would be very important, I talked to Brian Arthur about it, that the economists should work out you know, the, all the collateral consequences of that because we cannot do it. I am a chemist, uh, so he is a chemist, I am a biologist, but we did realize that this would have a tremendous effect on you know, what's happening in the world of the finance and the economy. You just have to deviate this old idea that you have to pay, you know, this kind of growth that they are using for finance is not given by God. I mean, that's a habit that they have uh, accustomed to, but, you know, you can change it once people realize that it has dramatic consequences for them. Also, by the way, if you are using a parabolic growth law in the, instead of the exponential growth, you cannot have the 1% phenomenon, right? That, uh, you know, that as you are now watching the data, you know, more and more uh, wealth is accumulating in, a, in, a, in, in the hands of uh, a decreasing number of people. That ultimately um, is consonant with the exponential type of growth, but it would just not, it cannot happen if you had adopted a parabolic uh, growth law for uh, the financial um, interest calculations. Okay, so that's something that we put on the, on the carpet. So, with all this, what we want is that these thought patterns, which come from originally very surprising disciplines, the, the hyperbolic growth and the selection consequences of hyperbolic growth law came from considerations of the origin of life. A hyperbolic growth was known already by Voltaire and Kostitzin in the Golden Age of Sierra, but they didn't realize the selection consequences. They didn't know the selection consequences. Parabolic growth was not even considered until the famous von Kidrovsky paper in Chemistry in 86, and it was in 90, whatever, 92 or 93, that at first I thought that it would also lead to something like survival of the fittest. It didn't. I discovered that it leads to coexistence, but with selectivity. But, but you, you, there is no dramatic increase, and it, there is no dramatic death in the system. And it was much later, a few years ago, when Günther realized, but uh, when, when you wrote, actually it was 2008 when you had this big crisis and so on, he thought, okay, but so how does it relate to growth that we have been always considering in the fields of chemistry and biology? And then he realized that what we should do is to actually make a proposal that the growth dynamics of the system, which you can define, for example, in the central bank, must be changed. If it can be changed, it could have dramatic and positive consequences to the system that we don't know. But this shows what a thought pattern is in the making, so to speak.